good afternoon, good morning. So those of you in North America, good afternoon and good evening to the rest of the world. We want to welcome you to this dialogue. Uh, we've been listening in to many of the conversations. Now we put together a panel of uh, leaders in the clean cooking space to talk to us now about some of the how. There was a lot of indication earlier, discussions about what we need to do, why we need to do it, and the sense of urgency that we have. But now we want to talk a little bit more about how and also how we can collaborate across countries, but also across institutions to really bring clean cooking solutions and technologies to the places where they are badly needed now. Generally, um, all around the world, people say this is the defining decade for energy transitions. And as uh, uh, Dimfna and others have laid out at the very beginning and Jilin, we are way behind in terms of meeting the many targets we set on clean cooking solutions, not only on the SDG 7, but even at the country level, individual countries, what they were supposed to do, we have not seen much movement. Um, so roughly still about 3 billion people lack uh, modern energy cooking services. And so there's a lot to do. We have a good panel. Our first panelist, Dami Lola, uh, on the Secretary General and Special Representative for the Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. You've been very busy. You hosted the world, literally the whole world, just two weeks ago in the first high-level summit on energy in 40 years. You're just recovering from that. And of course, you're leaving the whole world again in, in Glasgow. So I know you're very busy and thank you for giving us time here. Um, you did very well two weeks ago to, to try to make sure that when we talk about energy access, we're talking about electrification, access to electrification and access to clean cooking solutions. Why do you think there has been this dichotomy that people talk more the, the discussion on access is dominated by electrification, not even electrification for cooking, but just access to electricity. Why is that and what more can we do to make sure that we discuss both at the same level to keep the momentum that you started a few weeks ago? Over to you, Damilo. Um, thank you, Kande. It's always wonderful to have the first head of SE for All on a call with you. And I'm hoping I'm doing a good job implementing some of your great initiatives. You, like you're doing much thing. better than me, Daniela. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to start in, I don't think there's enough knowledge universally on just how much harm not having clean cooking actually causes and the harm it causes to women in particular. Obviously, when it comes to women and gender, people look the other way in all sectors, it's unfortunately, including the power sector. And we focus on industry and electrification and think that's the only way to get people out of poverty. But when you do see the stats, which is the great work that's happening with the CCA right now of you know, spending five hours a day trying to get access to to, to fuel wood to actually cook. One of the largest causes of deforestation, 4 million people are dying every year just from the continent we're from, Kande, because of that. It makes you really, really rethink your strategy, not talk about gender-based violence and all these other things that are happening. And when we are faced with a pandemic where you have all these people who just can't stay at home because they will die because they have no access to the basic needs of food, I think it is... Um, it has made everyone pay attention and it's made everyone realize that you can't talk about SDG 7. You can't talk about true energy access if we don't really tackle the issue of clean cooking. So um, again, we work in you know, partnership with the CCA in trying to get the message across, but also showing people the direct links between electrification and clean cooking. There's no point going into a community in my previous job and, and giving them access to solar renewable power, but they're still cooking with fuel wood. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And then and the approach we are taking at the UN and also at Sustainable Energy for All is how do we have integrated energy solutions? How do we have when people think about SDG 7 by default? They're thinking about access to electricity and also access to clean cooking solutions. We um, completed our first integrated energy plan on my country, Nigeria, where we looked at a model to say, these are the amount of people who need electrification, that's great. But who needs clean cooking as well? 
because there is a lack of data on that. And what is the best type of cool, clean cooking? Is it LPG? Is it e-cooking? Is it biomass? We get hung up on, um, are we using gas or not, instead of the conversation in the, where are these people and what is the sustain, most sustainable way of getting it to them? And I guess my third point would be on the um, just the economic viability of a lot of these solutions. These are hundreds, maybe millions of jobs for women in the value chain of clean cooking, um, you know, in terms of supply chains and everything that we need. So for me, I, I, you know, I think as we're trying to get out of, you know, one of the worst pandemics, which is still affecting many parts of the developing world at a shocking rate, we also need to think about the business of clean cooking and the opportunities of clean cooking. And when we put that all together, obviously with the policy and the regulatory work that's been going on, but if we just even showcase the projects, because projects determine policy at the end of the day from where we're from, I think people will really see that um, clean cooking is formidable for economic growth and also impact for women. Andy, back to you. I think Kande is frozen, Dimfla, you might yeah. have <laughs> um, so I think, Kande, we may have lost you, um, but we will continue on. I'm Mental. sure he'll be... Oh, there he is. Yeah, you, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, Dimfla, I'll come to you, but I want to press uh, uh, Damilola a little bit more while we wait for Maria and others to join. Uh, Damilola, you mentioned that we, we it's sometimes it's lack of knowledge, mm -hmm. and part of that involves presenting the evidence to policymakers within a country that here is uh, 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 how many people depend on biomass. Here are the solutions. And you, in, in one of the working groups you organized, you had it on data. What do we need to do to enhance data collection and putting that evidence together? I know you've been pushing that also a little bit. Um, I spoke about it a little bit, but most of it is to do with actually having proper integrated energy planning. In a lot of these countries, most people don't know where the people who don't have access to clean cooking are, both in rural and in urban settings, because it's also seen as a rural problem, but it, we see a lot of the effects also in urban settings. Mm -hmm. I think information about the um, ability to pay and the willingness to pay, there's some really, really cool AI stuff that's happening right now. And in the Nigerian case, it was actually quite shocking. We found that half the people who didn't have access to or who we thought didn't have access to clean cooking actually didn't have the actual access to the delivery points. They could actually pay without being subsidized at all. All this information is really important. And it's important where you're putting in frameworks of businesses around, um, around this and, and the private sector, which we all know is very, very critical, especially the local private sector in, in, in this task of achieving um, universal clean cooking. Uh, Dimfna, you, thanks to you and many others, um, we've been able to raise the profile on clean cooking. Um, let us assume that we want to, re to remain positive that uh, our field marshal, Dami Lola, in COP26 will even make the call bigger for us. All of that is good. But I know you've also said, Dimfna, that look, the action is at the country level also, mm -hmm. in which case you and your team You've come up with the concept of delivery units. Uh, where do they fit in this in terms of action, in terms of some of the planning, integrated planning that Damilola mentioned? Why delivery units and why are the controller? Yeah, no, absolutely, Kande. And I, I think it's exactly to the points that Damilola was um, speaking about that all of the um, collective actions that need to be done at a country level to make sure that clean cooking programs are designed um, financed and implemented uh, is really dependent um, on having these delivery units at a country level because if they are not um, equipped, if they're not um, staffed in the, in the appropriate manner and if they're not housed at the appropriate um, part within the government, there is just not one entity that really focuses on clean cooking, unfortunately. And we want to change that. We want to have this one unit whose only job it is, just like it's my only job, Kande, to make sure that we reach universal access to clean cooking. And I want these units to really only focus on making sure that there's clean cooking programs, financing, and implementation. And I think those last two parts are really important. We need to move away from 
planning important, but then we really need to focus on what can we do collectively through the delivery units network to make sure that these delivery units have access to the appropriate financing to then really implement these programs. And it means making sure that there is integrated energy planning. It means sure making sure that they have access to the right data through the evidence to um, action help that we're also creating. And so all of those things need to be con concentrated with a group of people who have the power to execute against these ambitions programs. And that part is fascinating and, and inspiring to me. And, and I've seen it work elsewhere. And I'm really keen to make sure that we create something as impactful and powerful for the clean cooking sector. I, I, I was a minister many light years ago, and I know the challenge. Yeah. When you want to do something, you don't have the staff with the technical capacity. So I fully can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, but then the, I, I, I wanted to raise another level. And, and you are very right. We can plan, but those plans also have to be translated to some kind of policy that goes to the cabinet of the government and then the parliament to approve. Parliament, yeah. Uh, uh, we have a case now in Sierra Leone. We have a compact. It's, it's, it's a list of intentions. Now you have to take each of those intentions and really formulate something. Uh, isn't that another area where you need uh, these delivery units to yeah, translate absolutely. intention to real action? Over to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's it's one part of the delivery units network that I'm excited about, which is a lot of this we will do through partnerships. And I know there's other organizations who really focus on how do you convince parliamentarians to really start enacting the right policy framework around some of these interventions. And so absolutely, um, where possible, we would work with partners who are really focusing on that part of um, the ecosystem as well, Kande, because as an organization, we can't do everything by ourselves, right? We really need to embrace um, and, and truly live through partnerships to make sure that this um, gets implemented with the boldness and the ambition that we're looking for. I can see big opportunities here when where those delivery units begin to network amongst each other. Absolutely. Good experiences from one region to the other, one country to the other. And with that, I wanted to transition. I don't know if Taria is, is with us now. Taria, did you join in? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Aha, you're here. Taria, Damilola mentioned we're cutting down the trees very fast uh, in a number of countries, in my country here. If you're looking at Freetown, the capital, you see the trucks coming in with the wood. You see the same in Addis. You see the same in Lagos. So we're, the, the cities are becoming graveyards for the forests. But I still feel that sometimes people don't see that connection well enough. Lack of clean cooking, deforestation, and climate. How do we close that circle? Absolutely. Um, and this is actually exactly one of the issues we're trying to tackle. Um, you know, I run an infrastructure private equity fund um, covering West Africa and based in Lagos. And we recently launched um, the West African ARM Harris Cities and Climate Transition Fund being supported by the Global Innovation Lab. And one of the areas we are trying to connect more dots and sort of make firmer lines is really the role of urbanization in climate um, action, because it's an area where the growth of emissions will likely be more rapid, given how much movement there will be to the, to the urban areas. One of the points we make is that the more we electrify the rural areas, we only will energize ambition, and they will all move to the cities. And what happens is that there is a sense that the, the African cities are wealthy, that they're mid-market, and that the cities don't need help and that poverty is rural. But the reality is that poverty is urban because there's so much pressure on urban areas. I think a lot of the developed markets or the, the, the representatives from the West, when they fly into Lagos or Abidjan, you know, they fly into the nicest parts of town, they stay in the nicest parts of town, and they don't go to 80% of the city, which is effectively a slum. And where thing is being done with firewood, with kerosene, and that a lot of the pollution in cities is driven by cooking, urbanization, congestion. And the reality is that our African cities are actually the point on the spear when it comes to climate action and then climate vulnerability. And so it is a difficult conversation to have because there is such an emphasis on 
rural poverty, which is part of the challenge, and we do need to solve for rural poverty. But the, the fact is that urbanization is also part of the solution. Um, urban areas present some of the largest contributions of GDP. In West Africa, our urban centers contribute anywhere from 25 to 65% of GDP. That's huge. Um, and so what it means is that a lot of urban projects are commercially viable. Um, but, you know, the re and, excuse me, the reality is that a lot of it is addressing climate. And so what we've been trying to engage with our investors on is how we can support clean cooking in cities. And the point about that Dami makes about integrated energy and the need for hybrid energy solutions to take us to a low carbon future is something we all have to embrace. Because the reality is that electric cooking will have its place. Other forms of cooking, be it LPG or whatever it is, they all have the role in the different sort of pockets of activity. And I think the challenge is if we say we're only going to have the perfect solution, then we may actually have deforested to too great an extent before that perfect solution is actually affordable and readily sort of available. And so this is one of the struggles is how do you integrate multiple paths to clean and cleaner energy? Um, as a private investor, you know, there are sort of obvious ways. I mean, LPG in Nigeria is an easy place to, to finance, but there are risks. You know, could LPG assets become stranded? Um, how do we ensure that the LPG um, uh, spectrum fits into energy transition and NDC commitments, right? Because there's actually a place where clean cooking supports NDC, meeting NDC. So, I'll, you know, we'll give you some interesting data. In terms of Nigeria's emissions, something like 25 to 20 to 30 percent is the FAO um, LU. Right. And so deforestation and land use is such a big part of our emissions. We actually need science to study to what extent is a short term use of LPG important to stop gap, build ability to pay network based systems and but make sure we're in a, on a pathway to electric solutions. Right. I mean, th there's a lot of work that needs to be done, yeah. but partnering with investors is also important for sustainability because when you have private investors, we always want the best, most sustainable solution that's stickiest. And so to the extent that that falls under policy, then we can also be, be guided. And so these are our challenges in that we are struggling to invest in clean cooking because it's, um, it's, it's nerve wracking. It, frankly, it's nerve wracking. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I like what you said. Let the good not be the victim of the perfect. We'll get to the perfect solution. But in the interim, we need to save lives. We need to save the forests. And, and we can learn uh, the, uh, better transition if we deal with some of the solutions like LPG that, that are available. I'm sure you've also given some insights for Damilola when she's making a claim to that 100 billion per year that is going to be pledged in COP26, that some of that has to go into clean cooking. So I transition to you, Dami Lola. You know, private sector is important. We've just heard from Tyria about the importance of that. Um, what more can we do to get private sector interested in investing in the clean cooking supply chain value chain? Uh, maybe Tyria will back you up, but Dami Lola, as you head for, for COP, will you have a message for the private sector as well? Well, I'm hoping Terrier brings millions, if not hundreds of billions into the sector. I have, have a lot of faith in, in, in what she's capable of doing. Um, I think we also need to not lie to ourselves and know that risk capital is important. You know, first loss capital, grant capital is an important equation, especially if we're going to get to the last mile. And back to what was being said, the, the planning does matter. We've, we're lucky to actually have an energy transition plan for Nigeria. I'm hoping it is presented before COP, if not at COP. But it, the, the figures are staggering. First, it shows you can use gas up to 2040 and nothing happens. You can still achieve net zero. So that's important, not just gas for LPG, but for gas for base load to integrate renewables, which is, which is another conversation for another day. But it also shows that Nigeria alone needs on the regions of $410 billion above business as usual spending. 
um, the clean, converse, clean cooking conversation, if we are still having these discussions and we're talking about hundreds of millions, it's so disappointing. And that's why we decided to like really homing on energy compacts and make people responsible for it. I, I don't see why climate funding does not go to clean cooking. I don't see the argument for it. There's risks in all sectors and we need to stop people thinking that Everything investable is large scale with sovereign guarantees, let's be honest, you know, because the knock on effect of saving someone's life needs to actually count for something in the environment, you know, that we're in. And I think that's where grant and risk funding actually plays a role. When we know, let's be honest, private sector is not going to come until A, B, C, D happens. I also think there's a role for the DFIs and the MDVs even strongly, to actually chart a way of what are their actual plans, right? You know, this is an SDG. This is something that they have to actually invest in. But, uh, you know, I don't think we ask enough questions and maybe different is best into this or of the World Bank, of the AFDB and say, can I have your clean cooking plan? Can I see where you're targeting, what you're targeting, and, and what you're doing? I, I found that invaluable in my previous role in Nigeria. Like, twist the conversation. You say we don't have this, 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 that. Fine, but what are your plans to support me in, in everything that I'm doing? I, I, I honestly, truly believe with everything in my being that projects drive policy. Um, I don't see, I've never seen a situation where you wait for a perfect policy and then things start. You really have to show things working. And this is from 10 years ago when people told me solar doesn't even work. Um, so there's a lot of convincing that has to be done. I think this year, the stars are just aligned for clean cooking. I mean, with Diffner's group, with Kande, that everybody with the um, AU, EU coming up, everybody's screaming, but we just need to start screaming louder. And we all have to use all our platforms and have a set of talking points where we're demanding for people and also include the women in these conversations, you know, the women that are suffering from these. So more videos, more things to show people because unfortunately we, we're still dealing with the, a large part of the population who think this issue is an inconvenience, you know, almost like, oh, my phone died. Oh, what a shame. I have to wait to charge it. And it isn't. It, it's killing. And I don't even think that the stats we have are, are, are accurate, really. It's killing a lot more people um, than, we, than we think. And it's affecting our planet at a very alarming rate. So, yeah, I think we, we all have to stand up for this. We have to tweet. We have to talk about it. And we have to make it just as sexy as climate is right now um, in our conversations. Um, thank you very much. And one, uh, Taria, we, we need climate finance. What do we need to do to for that resource? Well, let me start first by saying that we need more than 100 billion. And um, the reality was that 100 billion dollars was part of the deal at Paris. And uh, 100 billion was not met. And there were quite a lot of flaws with the 100 billion in that a lot of it went to mitigation, very little went to adaptation, and it was very difficult to access. And, you know, we can list off a lot of challenges that uh, we face with climate finance. I think we need to be emphasizing that that is the floor. It was, the, it's um, a number that was committed to in the past, and it is not the number that takes us to um, neutrality and carries Africa along and leaves no one behind and ensures a just transition. So I'm going to be clamoring behind um, um, Dami for more than 100 billion to support the energy transition and or the, the just transition. Um, but a lot of that should be done in partnership with the private sector. Um, and the reality that DFIs have a key role to play with providing concessional capital to try to mobilize private capital, especially um, institutional capital is going to be key. Um, we're, because we're going to be investing new assets, grant funding or um, project development funding is going to be crucial. And so we need DFIs to go to where the risks are greatest and see themselves as catalyzing capital. Um, and we also need um, the ESG and climate frameworks for global institutional capital to be rewarded for financing African climate projects specifically. And so there needs to be a required, like a, a way for us to be able to double click into African climate. Right now, a lot of global allocators allocate to Africa as a pool. 
versus emerging markets, whereas we need to be looking at African energy access, African climate, African climate transition. So we need, there needs to be a lot more granularity with how we mobilize and, and encourage institutional capital to come into Africa. Um, sort of just um, uh, touching on going back to the point of women and cooking and the crisis that we have. I think part of the reason why um, in Seoul, there's, there's maybe women get so interested in this. You know, I'm a mother and my children in Lagos su suffered from severe asthma that really came from biomass cooking from next door. And the reality is that the levels of respiratory disease that we are struggling with in urban centers in Africa as a result of this problem, it is an acute challenge. And so I think for us to be able to sort of express that it's it's not even a long-term existential issue, it's actually a pollution crisis. And so we need to, if we think about dealing with it as a pollution crisis, then we have to think, what are the short-term solutions to dealing with a pollution crisis? And then it's the medium long-term solutions to the climate crisis. It, it's a good transition to one of our leaders who can talk knowledgeably about that, My, uh, Dr. Maria Nera, uh, who heads that group in WHO dealing with climate and the interface of energy and health. Maria, thank you for joining us. It's a nice segue to you. Um, thanks to COVID, people started paying a little bit more attention to the health and energy nexus. But of course, you and I worry about energy, lack of clean cooking and women's health and children's health. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, and apologies for joining you so late. It took me a lot of energy to be able to finish the other meeting and join you, but it was a promise, so here I am, and I'm really very pleased. And my key message, Kanda uh, and others, is that um, WHO launched it, and I'm sure you hear about it, or I hope you hear about it, the health argument for climate action. We launched it last week. We are taking that uh, healthy prescription to the COP26. And what we are saying essentially is that uh, if you tackle the causes of climate change and air pollution, because for us, this is almost the same agenda, and I fully agree with the previous speaker, uh, it's all about pollution. You can obtain enormous health, uh, enormous benefits for, for your health. One of those enormous benefits for your health will come from cleaner the air we are breathing. And, uh, to clean the air we are breathing, the household energy will play an enormous role. I don't need to convince you about that. And the cooking at the household level will bring, again, will com contribute enormously to this dialogue. So for us, this is a clear uh, agenda of public health. We are fighting very much to, for people to understand on a very uh, concrete, pragmatic, and clear way the connections uh, there are no separate agendas. For us, it's all about uh, public health or lack of public health. And in this case, if you don't uh, have a solid access to clean energy, clean sources of energy, your health will be at risk. This time it was uh, COVID-19, but uh, the, the next one is already here. It's called climate change. And the next one can come from anywhere. So clearly we need to reduce air pollution. And to reduce air pollution, clean cooking will play a critical role. How we accelerate that, how we uh, talk by doing that about gender, about uh, human rights, about uh, accelerating the SDG, is also well connected that I think we have a huge responsibility on telling them the more you do on, on tackling the causes of climate change, the more you will be reducing air pollution. And to reduce air pollution, we count on you to fix all the pieces that are contributing to that and household air pollution is contributing. I was reading very recently something that was saying that uh, household uh, use of energy in Africa can contribute enormously to this um, facing this um, uh, challenge of uh, uh, which sources of energy. I think in Africa, there will be a, a, an incredible opportunity if we take it right on how we cook, how we heat, how we light our houses and, and the demand needs to be generated there for clean sources of energy to do so. The, 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 the more we accelerate, more lives you are saving. And this is the, the argument that I think can 
contribute to convince our love uh, leaders uh, that we'll be meeting in Glasgow. I'm very frustrated because, you know, it's COP26. So for 26 yeah. years, come on. <laughs> so for me, this has to be COP1 in the sense that it has to be the, the COP1, number one for health. And we are if we are able to do that, maybe the health community is less patient than the environmental community. And then we will be able to, to put, a, 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 you know, a, an incredible motivation force there and, and, and driving aging or something because basta. I mean, 45 million doctors and nurses and health professionals were signing our healthy prescription for, for COP26. So I hope that now we will start to see more uh, white coats demonstrating and pushing and, and, and advancing this because we need their, their voice as well to to, to thank, tell thank, you. thank you very much. Dimfna, I have the last word for you as I listen to Maria and I'm thinking how much we've made access to vaccines a human right. And mm -hmm. Maria has just made the strong case also that lack of clean cooking causing so much health problems. Maybe it's also a right. I mean, you look at the numbers, 4.7 million people died now, but we are saying over 4 million die every year from lack of clean cooking. So last word for you, uh, Dimfna, isn't this the time we make access to clean cooking a human right? Because it's so basic. People should not die when they cook. Over to no. you, Dimfna. No, absolutely. Nobody should. And it's it's 100% a human right. And the fact that, that we are still talking about this issue with, with the lack of... Um, funding and attention that it's currently still getting it's it's frustrating and and i'm with maria i'm like basta it's enough it really is enough already like we really have to start moving forward in a completely different way and i think more than anything this conversation just inspires me and continues to inspire me because women who are leading these these big initiatives and bold organizations like we need to collectively move this issue forward and and start shying away from like not asking those really blunt questions as Damilo Lola was referring to like where is that money like stop talking about it and show me where your plans are show me where your money is because it is really unacceptable and I think previously I would always say oh, I have a deep sense of urgency I now have a deep sense of frustration and just like it's enough so I'm I'm Maria I'm like basta is going to be in my new word going forward it really is enough and and it's wonderful to have all of you here and joining us in this conversation, Damilola, Torrie, and Maria, because it, it really is collective action with women like us that can really move this forward because it should be a, a human right. Damilola, they gave you some talking points. Basta, <laughs> it's enough. This is year one for clean cooking. I, I, You're one I, for I clean cooking. That you want to do yes. a so we say basta, yeah. not basta. Over to you, Don't over to you. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I would say clean cooking and electrification, please. But I just wanted to put some statistics. When COVID hit, the Global North found $17 trillion. Okay? That was the disaster because it affected the Global North. We need to demand the same mm -hmm. for the Global South. The money automatically appeared from nowhere at very, very sub 1% interest rates. So please, let's bear that in mind. So yeah. when there is a pandemic and a disaster, we, we do find a way of finding the money. And I hope we can do that for the healthcare systems and clean cooking moving forward. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you, our panelists. Thank you, great leaders. We look forward to seeing you at COP as well, and we'll help join to make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Seeing you. Okay. Bye. Yeah, what a, a very inspiring, I think, panel and these women that are just really leading the way on this issue. I leave um, today feeling so much more energized and just excited and, and determined to go forward. Before we close today, I just want to remind everybody to register for and tune in to the rest of the events we are hosting this week of Clean Cooking. We have some great events lined up, including the next webinar in our Transitioning to Clean Cooking series with WHO and HEPA, a preview of new insights on the global investment landscape for clean cooking, and a webinar introducing Clean Cooking Explorer, the geospatial data tool that CCA has developed with partners, and last, a virtual matchmaking and networking all week with support of, from Get Invest. So please sign up and join in, and thank you for all of the great sessions today.